Good morning, good morning, ladies and gents. Uh, welcome once more to another episode of Life in Perspective. Thank you so much for always tuning in and following. For those of you who are following our social media pages, thank you so much. And for those of you who don't know where we are, you can find us on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at life underscore in underscore perspective 2019. Life underscore in underscore perspective 2019 and you can also find us on facebook on life in perspective we are continuing from what we've been touching on for the past few weeks we've been dealing with the pillar of response to stimuli and last week we took the time to explain what does response to stimuli actually really means what does it mean to respond to stimuli and what we actually did was to first probably explain what a uh, stimuli is what stimulus or stimuli is and we explained that last week uh, in terms of something that activates a reaction something that 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 stimulates a function from 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 operating we looked at a few things that describe what a stimuli or a stimulus is and i think we we had a fair understanding of what this actually entails and i believe that we are probably in a better space now to understand that everything around us in our environment is meant to stimulate you in one way or another um whether it stimulates you towards learning or whether it stimulates you towards reaction, whether it stimulates you towards a response or whatever it stimulates you towards, everything that you interact with in your environment is meant to stimulate you one way or another. And that's the understanding that we need to have because it's very critical for us to then know that whatever we interact with has some degree of stimuli that it projects towards us and there will also be a response and and we we looked at some of the even some of the physics laws that you will look at you will realize i think newton's third law of motion that says for every action there's an opposite equal reaction so you will find that many a times for 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 tangible physical things um if you throw something up the higher you throw it up uh, the, the 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 faster it will come back down and 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 the fall it, it it's heavier you'll hear other people that that have idioms such as the bigger they are the harder they fall um you know it, it talks to the issue of if you elevate something too high when it comes back down it comes back smashing quite heavily and that that is basically within the category of what we would call a response reaction um action reaction action reaction a, a class of, of of activities and it becomes important for us to also realize that in as much as objects also have they are governed by the law of action reaction humans are also governed by the same law the only difference is that objects do not have the will they don't have the feelings and the emotions and the mental capacity to be able to respond uh, they react they don't respond uh, the reason why we separate between reaction and response is because a reaction is based on the stimuli whatever stimuli that you put in the reaction will be purely based on that stimuli which is i i believe why newton specifically said for every action there is a reaction that is equal to the action that was put in so i understand that because for any object that is not um uh, that doesn't have will that doesn't have feelings and emotions it's it's very straightforward for you to say whatever that you do to it 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 you know if you pull an elastic band the further you pull it, it will come back at the same same distance that you pull it. And the same force you pull it with, it will project that same force back. Um, so you will find that many a times a lot of things that happen, if you, if, if you take a tennis ball and you hit it against the wall, it will come back at the same force you threw it on the wall at. Because it doesn't have will, it doesn't decide to say, no, if you throw him against the wall, I can choose to just stick to the wall and not come back. It doesn't have that. But humans are unique in the sense that they have the capacity the capacity to reason, to express feelings and emotions, and thereby making decisions. They have information that they can gather in their minds. They have information that they can use to actually make valuable decisions. And that information is what's actually critical with what we touched on last week to say, this is what we mean by having a balanced approach to life. It's by having an understanding that says every piece of information I interact with as a person, that piece of information has ultimately an impact in my future decisions. Whatever I decide in the future is influenced by what I am learning today. 
whatever I decide in the future is influenced by whatever I have gathered today. And this becomes important because what it means is that as a person, you need to find yourself in a space where you have a better understanding of the fact that what you gather today, what you get involved in today, what you feed your mind today, whether it's balanced or not, ultimately it would influence your decision. So if the information I'm receiving today, my exposures, how I get exposed to certain things, how I get exposed to a lot of things around my life. I need to be very critical in what I allow myself to be exposed to because those exposures ultimately lead to thinking patterns, ultimately lead to behaviors. And ultimately, if they continue and they are allowed to, to flourish and grow, ultimately they will lead to what we call personality traits. Um, some of them are personality traits that are, are toxic. Some of them are personality traits that are that are good, that are positive, some are negative. And you will find that there are some people, they have grown in such an environment where they've developed such a negative way of looking at things that they never see anything good in anything. Even if you come up with something, a smart idea or anything, because of how they are developed, they are going to just immediately not even respond to it. They are going to immediately not just even um, want to interact with it because ultimately what it boils down to is it boils down to the fact that every single person that is there has everything to do, whatever that they've been exposed to in their past life has everything to do with where they will ultimately end up. Either by thinking patterns, by behavior, by actions, by speech. You can even tell the background of a person and the kind of person they are by how they talk. Uh, you can tell if this person is level-headed or cool-minded by just how they talk. And there's a lot that your your your, your reaction or your action tells. It, it foretells. It, it gives people uh, information in advance on, on, on what you do personally as a person, what you get involved in personally as a person, whether you are developing yourself or not, whether you are... That is why you will see when you sit with the psychologist, all you do there is talk. Because while you are talking, there are a series of things that they are able to feed from. They are able to actually pick up from and be able to actually figure out the kind of person. Yes, they do ask questions. They do try and find out what is it that you are thinking, where you are going, your emotions and all of that stuff. But ultimately, it boils down to the fact that whatever that you share with them and whatever that you put out there is what determines what they will evaluate as personality traits, things that are healthy, unhealthy about you as a person. And ultimately, they can put you in a platform where you are able to deal with certain things that might negatively be influencing your life. And this becomes very important because what it means is that as a person, you need to realize Realize that every single thing that you do on a day-to-day -day basis has the ability to affect what you ultimately decide in the future. Yes, for some people, you might find that the decisions you are making today are influenced by something that you you you, you developed or something you 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 took on as a habit maybe five or ten years ago, sometimes even maybe a year ago. It depends on how, how influential that thing is or the impact of that thing in your in your life is. And, and definitely what that ultimately boils down to is the fact that whatever then that you would have interacted with by exposure is what then led to your, your, your decisions and how you make decisions. And also how you, your desires and your preferences as a person are determined. Those are also determined by exactly the same thing. Whatever you spend your time doing, whatever you spend your time talking about, whatever you spend your time absorbing, you know, whatever you spend your time with, the type of people you spend time with, more than half the time, they will lead to what you would call your desires and your preferences as a person. And many a times it is influenced by the association. It is influenced by exposure to the type of information. You'll find that if a person is exposed to a lot of religious information, the, the likelihood of them having a desire and several preferences that influence things that have to do with religion is higher. If they're influenced to scientific information, the same applies. If they're influenced to educational information, um, if they're influenced by biological or medical inf information, uh, psychological, you know, political, economical, whatever aspect of life that influence you, more than half the time you will find that if it's good information, you will find that in that area of your life, you tend to have a better understanding of how to navigate yourself in life as opposed to a person that does not have that kind of information. So what does that mean? What it means is that if your life has all these different compartments, you need to then have that understanding to say, unless I develop a balanced approach to life, 
it's going to create a lot of issues for me because I might develop in some areas and be underdeveloped in others. I might be overdeveloped in some and underdeveloped in some. And you'll find that many times this becomes a very big challenge for a lot of people because we tend to actually do most of the things we like more than anything else. And we don't realize that life is about balance, that you need to grow and develop in almost as much aspects of your life as possible. You need to actually spend as much time in the different aspects or the categories or the compartments of your life as possible. Because when you do that, you indeed are putting yourself in a space where you can have a balanced approach to life because you are just as equally knowledgeable in spiritual things as you are in financial things, in economic things, in, in, in scientific things, and in other things that would most probably have. Yes, I'm not saying you are going to grow in every aspect of your life, but in those aspects of your life that align to your goals and aspirations, it would be very critical for you to prioritize those and make sure that in that particular line of things, you do very well because it will allow you to then excel in what in achieving in achieving your goals, in achieving your aspirations, in achieving whatever that you desire. So you develop yourself in that particular area. Say, for an example, you want to be an academic person. You want to be an academic person, maybe in the scientific field. Um, over and above you specializing in the scientific field, it will require you to develop other skills that are going to give you a balanced approach. Because many a times you'll find a lot of people that are strong intellectually, but they are not strong socially. They are not strong emotionally. They are not strong uh, uh, spiritually. They are not strong when it comes to dealing with situations and adversities and difficulty in their lives and this is one of the reasons why today i want to talk to you specifically about why is it important for us to develop certain aspects of our life so you know people that are in psychology have developed what we call quotients quotients a quotient is a major uh, of a degree of something. So when something is divided, so some of you who have done mathematics, you will realize when something is being divided by another, you would call that a quotient. I'm not going to go into the detail of what is divided with what, but I'm going to talk to you about the quotient so that you understand what those quotients are. Now, the basic principle behind quotients is that every person that develops a certain quotient in their lives will allow themselves to excel in that specific area or in that specific category of that quotient. And there are several advantages and disadvantages of developing one quotient and ignoring others. And you will realize that all these quotients that are given, they are given such that you have a better understanding of, of the, human, the human being and you are able to apply yourself to environment much better so that you learn that there are other quotients that will help you balance other quotients. There are other quotients that are dependent on other quotients that you need to do better. Now, there are four general quotients that the people in psychology have actually come up with that the psychologists have developed. But I'm going to talk to five of them because I've added one that I believe stands out very strongly for me as an individual as well. And over time, I have perceived that it's one quotient that is not necessarily within the standard uh, nomenclature or the standard uh, categories of, of, of quotients, but it is a very important, important quotient. Now, there are four different types of quotients that have been highlighted. The one is IQ which deals with the measure of intelligence, the measure of intelligence, which means is the level of, of the ability of a person, you know, how elastic your mind is to absorbing information, learning new things, analyzing information, and being able to come up with um, solutions or innovations around that specific um, a, a topic that would have been thrown at you. So your ability to learn, to be flexible and adapt mentally, to be able to actually come up with you know, innovations and, 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 and the level to which you can absorb information. So those measures are within the category of what we call IQ. IQ is basically the intelligence, intelligence quotient, intelligence quotient. So there's a lot of definitions for intelligence. Obviously, a lot of people would, would, would want to define that differently. But, uh, you know, medically and biologically, if you were to look at at what we talk about when we talk about intelligence is we just basically talk about the elasticity of your mind because your mind is elastic, elastic in a sense that it can learn, it can grow, it can, it can expand, it can do all sorts of things in its ability and our ability to use that. And I've used an example, you know, in the past few weeks to say the human being in his existence with everything that he has done in the world today, you know, coming up with airplanes, cars and all those things, he's only been using 9% of their cerebral capacity. 
Now, it goes to show that as human beings, in as much as we are intelligent and we are able to do what we can do, we've only been able to use a portion of our ability to think. So we, we have the elasticity, but we've only been using about 9% of that. And that's what's actually very critical where the intelligence is concerned. So the intelligence, basically, IQ deals with your, your, the educational side of things. It deals with innovation. It deals with invention. And you will see that a lot of people that have come up with some of the best inventions, they have a very high IQ. And we have a measure today that is used as an IQ measure where people can be measured to say, what is your IQ? What is the size of your IQ? And this is important because it allows then a person to be able to gauge whether they are stretching their minds to the limit or not. And there are people that have, have you know, transcended and passed the boundaries of what is known as normal measures of IQ. And there are people like that in our history. I mean, there's people that have lived, that have shown a level of IQ that has never been seen before. And this becomes important for us to understand, to say that capacity is not limited to what we can measure today. It can actually transcend that and it can go beyond that. The next one is your emotional quotient, which is the EQ. There's another one called social quotient, another one called adversity quotient, and the last one that I'm going to deal with is the spiritual quotient. So I've dealt with IQ. Let me touch on EQ. EQ is basically what you would call, um, the, it's an emotional quotient, and I think it's very important when it comes to you personally as a person, dealing with issues as a person, and also how you are able to express yourself as a person, but more importantly, how you are able to interact with people around you. And that, that becomes what we call an emotional quotient. And you'll find that a lot of people that do well in business, that do well in their careers, that do well in, 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 in fields that are forcing them to interact with people or the measure of the success in their fields is measured by how well they do with people. A lot of those people have a very high EQ, emotional quotient. They have a high EQ, which means emotionally, they have a handle of their emotions. They're able to manage their emotions. They're able to deal with their emotions and, and appropriate their emotions even in difficult situations. And they're able to actually use their emotions to get ahead in as far as getting things done more effectively and efficiently. And this becomes important because you will realize even some of the top billionaires in the world today, they might have not necessarily been the inventors of the innovations or the ideas that they are now, you know, getting a lot of money from. But they had, some of them had friends that were more IQ uh, than, than they were. But some of them, you find that they were EQ. They were able to actually take those ideas and manage. And once the business started, some of them you will see, they partnered with their smart friends. But that relationship didn't last long because ultimately it required it required more than just intelligence. And some people who are more intellectual than they are emotionally balanced, it creates a problem because many a times they fail to be able to actually navigate themselves around spaces that require them to interact with other people. A lot of intellectual and intelligent people prefer being alone. In fact, a lot of them are introverts. They would rather actually be in their own space, do their, and only come out once they've you know come up with an idea. It's very rare that you'll find an intellectual person that is an extrovert. Some of them are actually trying and they're developing themselves to go out and become extroverts. And you will realize that with them doing that, it's allowing them to experience more successes in their lives. And Elon Musk is one of those people that have, have demonstrated that you can actually have the ability to go out there and make things work. If you come out of that space where you are reserved and you come out in to a space where you've developed yourself so well that you are able to appropriate your emotions, emotions into your business, into your career, into your other areas of your of your of your of your of your areas of success, you are able to do much better. So this is one of those quotients that I believe are very important. Your emotional quotient. Make sure that this is one quotient that you look at as a person, how well you are. In in a prop how good you, you do in appropriating yourself emotionally. Whether you know, to yourself personally, do, do you avoid uh, uh, looking into emotions or do you actually take the time to explore and go into those emotions and find out what they really mean so that you can appropriate yourself better? It's important, but it's something that we will need to look at and it's very critical. The other one is a social quotient, is your social quotient. And this has everything to do with your human experience. You are a human being, you live among people, you interact with people all the time, you are in a social space. And your ability to be able to appropriate yourself socially, to be part of the social community, your ability to be able to, and you will find that some of the political leaders that we have in the past even had a very strong ability in this 
particular quotient. They they were very, very strong when it comes to this, especially people that work with people where their careers are dependent on people, on mobilizing people. Politically, you will see a lot of people that are politicians have to actually do very well when it comes to their social quotient because your ability to appropriate yourself socially, your ability to be able to understand the people you are dealing with and be able to actually, you know, appropriate yourself in, in mobilizing, in, in stimulating, in motivating, in doing all sorts of other things where people are concerned. And you will find this is one category where even motivational speakers need to actually be very good at it because they need to understand socially what the different social um, categories of people, the social classes of people, the different social um, um, cultures that you would also experience. And this is very important because even in the in the career working environment you'll find that a lot of people uh, that do well when it comes to their careers leadership specifically leadership specifically you will find that they do well when they actually take the time even if you go to any um uh, modules of, of leadership, whether in your MBA programs. Um, if you do any MBA programs um, and you do the leadership portion of that MBA, you will find that in the leadership level, there are certain things that have to do with you being able to understand people to a level where you understand their social background and understand their cultures, understand where they are coming from. Because how you then communicate to those people, the effectiveness of your communication and the effectiveness of how you apply yourself as a leader towards those people has everything to do with you understanding where they are coming from. So that social quotient becomes very important because then it influences how you are able to actually interact with people in a social space. Because look at it this way, even if you are a manager of 100 people or 120 people or 30 people, whatever it is, those people don't come from the same environment. They don't come from the same spaces. They don't come from the same areas of influence. They come from different and they don't speak the same language. Some of them are not the same ethnicity. They are not the same tongue. They are not the same, uh, 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 you know, uh, cultural background. They are different and in different places you will realize and, and they will teach you in that space to realize that if you go to China, for instance, even as a white or black person or Indian, if you go to China, you will find that in China they do things differently, even in the career and the business space. They do th things differently and for you to be able to uh, uh, get through to them, you will need to have an understanding of that cultural uh, setting. You need to have an understanding of that cultural setting for you to be able to appropriate yourself and this becomes important because in those social circles you are able to do better when you have a better understanding of what those people actually subscribe to and what they actually do so that social cushion becomes important so your human experience is very very critical in you making sure that as a person you make sure that every single interaction you have with people is a learning and it allows you to do better in the future in how you deal with people whether it's people that come you know Ghanaians deal with things differently and they have a certain culture around work ethic you'll find that if you go to Nigeria it's a bit different if you go to South Africa it's a bit different if you go to the Americas it's a bit different if you go to Europe it's also different so there are different ways in which people are doing so you can actually improve your quotient in this particular aspect by learning and having an understanding of how you can do things when you go out there and interact with different people. Sometimes we don't do well not because we are not good at what we do. Sometimes we are good, we are intelligent, and we are emotionally balanced. We, we, we emotionally, our EQ is high, but because our social uh, quotient is not that good, our SQ it becomes a problem because we cannot appropriate ourselves well in different cultural environments, in different ethnic environments, in different, um, you, you know, different uh, uh, tribal environments, different um, 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 racial environments. And that creates a limitation for a lot of people. The other one I want to touch on is the AQ adversity quotient. Adversity quotient basically deals, it's the measure of your ability to go through difficulty ability to go through difficulty ha huh? ability to go through difficulty so and, and 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 being able to use that and to go through difficulty and come out on the other end composed so it's the ability to go through trouble and come out on the other end to compose so let me recap so if your IQ is 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 basically a measure of your level of comprehension it's the level of comprehension. You Are you able to comprehend things? EQ then becomes the level of, 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 of the measure of ability to maintain a emotional and peaceful environment with others. You are able to live well with people. You are balanced emotionally. 
there is peace, there is harmony, there is understanding, which means your EQ is good. When it comes to X SQ, it's your ability ability to, to build networks and maintain them in, in simple form. It's the ability to build networks and maintain them. And over a period of time. So yes, there are people with an SQ, but you find because the SQ is low, um, many a times they'll find themselves in a space, they develop relationships, but they don't go far. And there are those then when it comes to uh, adversity quotient, which is the measure of the ability to go through difficulty and come out on the other end as, as, as strong, as strong, strong as you are. Now, this becomes important because what it means is that um, the adversities that you experience in life are going to be influenced by, or rather the experiences that you go through in life have the ability to influence the outcome of your life depending on how you deal with them on how or how you respond to them. For an example, you'll find people that every time when they go through adversity, they complain, they cry, they, they don't see any hope in that situation. Many a times those people tend to have lives that are stagnant. They tend to have lives that are full of questions and less answers. They tend to experience lives that are they are heavy and it's very common that you will find people like that going through stress and depression but you will find people with a higher quotient and this becomes important even in this time that we are living in there are a lot of people that are going through a lot of depression stress and strain and all these things and it's challenging because many of them don't actually ultimately find themselves succeeding and going through those things and coming out strong on the other end but what we what i'm trying to show you today is that you can develop your adversity quotient. You can allow yourself to be at the space where your survival instincts is so high that even when you go through difficulty, you look at trouble differently. And I mentioned this last week to say, when you go through trouble, look at trouble as a platform of growth. Look at trouble as a, 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 a period of learning. Look at difficulty as an opportunity for you to learn and do better for yourself in the future. Yes, yeah, sometimes these things can hit you and, and hit you down and you can be downtrodden and, and you feel defeated and you are thrown on the ground, even if that happens. But you need to have an understanding that all of that, all of that, that, even if it happens at that time, you can learn from it and pick yourself up and be able to do better in the future. It doesn't have to throw you down and make you feel hopeless and make you feel like there's nothing that is good that can ever happen to you as a person. But you need to have an understanding that you can develop whether the past has not been good. A lot of people that have a past that is not very good, they tend to even judge their future using that past. But a person with an adversity quotient that is high has an understanding that the past was for the learning. The future is for me to conquer. So what it means is that if I've learned enough where I have came from, where I am going, I'm going to do better. And it's important because you will embrace every single challenge that you go through in your life as an opportunity for growth and as, a, as an opportunity for development, as an opportunity for you to do better as a person. And this is very, very critical because a lot of people today have underestimated their ability to do well in life because they have measured themselves by the level of difficulty they experience. The level of difficulty you experience in yourself has in your life has very little to do with your capacity in life it doesn't mean uh, you know you, you are not doing well when you have challenges in fact some of the people that are doing well in life have more challenges have more challenges in their lives and part of the reasons why those challenges become important is because they are meant to develop that person to the next level and you need to embrace challenges and difficulty in your life with that thinking in mind to say, I am able to do better in life if I understand that every single thing that I go through, I go through it for a reason and there's a purpose behind it. And that purpose is for me to learn. It's for me to develop and develop certain character traits and develop certain values, certain attributes, certain virtues that will allow me to become a better person in the future. You find that a lot of people that are doing well in their lives today, they are doing well because there were, some of them were even motivated by the pain in their past to say, I can do better. And they wanted to come out of that trouble. And they worked so hard for them to get out of that trouble. And they started doing well. So a lot of people will say, yeah, look, uh, I remember watching a, a, a clip this one time. And someone was saying that they they, they, they have a love and hate relationship with, 
motivational speakers because they feel like motivational speakers will always tell you you can do something, but they never tell you that you need people to do it. I, I beg to differ because I believe one of the reasons why a motivational speaker needs to, yes, in as much as there are those who do that, but part of motivation also includes an element that says you don't live alone, which is one of the reasons why I'm teaching this quotient and one of the reasons why I gave you the social quotient, that you need to build networks. You need to build networks because they allow you. And sometimes even when you are in adversity, your networks can help you to survive it. When you are in adversity, your emotional quotient can help you to survive it. When you are in adversity, your IQ can help you come up with innovations that will bring solutions to problems. So you will find that at any given point in time in your life, you need to have a balance in these quotients. Hence, I've been saying from when I started that develop yourself to a level where you have a balanced approach to life. You have a balanced approach to life. So the last quotient I want to touch on is what I call the spiritual quotient. In my mind, this deals with your identity and your purpose as a person, the spiritual quotient. So what is a spiritual quotient? It's the measure of the depth of your relationship relationship of your relationship, your, your relationship, your, your relationship with your creator and your understanding of how this can be used to navigate the world around you. It's the measure of the depth of your relationship with your creator that allows you to be able to understand the world around you. The depth of your relationship with your creator to a level where it allows you to understand the world around you better. And this is why I'm saying this quotient, I call it SPQ, the spiritual quotient. It is supposed to help you identify yourself, know what your identity is, but also more importantly, to give you purpose. If you find some of the most excellent and the most successful communities in the world, let's take the Japanese. They've got what they call Ikigai. Ikigai is one of those measures that they are using to determine purpose, the value of doing certain things in life and how they contribute towards what you ultimately believe as your purpose in life. And this links directly to a spiritual quotient because what it allows you to then understand is to say, there are certain things that will never be fulfilling in my life. I might not even understand why I go through the trouble that I go through if I do not know what my identity and purpose is in life. But when I understand what my identity and purpose is in life, sometimes it makes it easier for me to understand and embrace the trouble because I understand that is in line with the development that will take me to where I want to be as a person because my identity and purpose in life is very clear. Why? Because I have a high SPQ. I have a high spiritual quotient and that high SPQ spiritual quotient because of my relationship with my creator allows me the depth that I need for me to navigate life with a better understanding of who I am and the purpose that I carry. It allows me depth in how I will navigate certain spaces that have to do that question who I am as a person and I will not necessarily identify myself as a black person, as a white person, as a Chinese or this or this. Yes, it, it, it is part of a definition, but it's a small part of who you are. It's a small part of who you are. And it becomes very important for you as a person to understand that even a car, a car in as much as it can be described and identified by its physical or outward appearance, but that's not what defines the actual capacity of that car. The actual identity and the actual purpose of the car is not always, in fact, the, the physical appearance of that vehicle is probably less than 10% of, of the de description of the identity and the purpose of that car. Now, even you as a person, the way you look, the way you are as a person, it's, it's, a, it's less than 10% of who you really are as a person by identity and purpose. And by you having depth, depth and understanding of who you are, purpose and identity, that allows you as a person to be able to navigate your spaces knowing that even your physical limitations, even your, your appearance does not dictate who you are as a person. And you cannot use your physical appearance and your outlook as a person to actually try and, and minimize or rather use that to, to degrade your, your, your importance, your purpose, and your identity as a person. But you need to do that. Because this is what determines what your existence is as a person, the value of your existence. If you want to define your existence as a person, you need to have a high SPQ. You need to have a high spiritual quotient because this will allow you to be able to identify yourself and be able to have purpose, clear purpose about who you are. Which means even if people can describe you by how you look, even if people can describe you by uh, the way you come across, 
even if people can describe it by where you come from, even people can describe it by your background, the challenges that you have, the country that you come from. Let me tell you something. That is less than 10% of who you are. Who you are lies in the depth of your understanding of your identity and purpose through a very deep relationship with your creator. Thank you so much for listening. We'll continue again next time.